and welcome to part four in the Shaping of Ireland series, The Norman Invasion. So far in the series, we've travelled through prehistoric and Gaelic Ireland, uncovering the mysteries, quirks and challenges faced by the early Irish peoples. Over the centuries, society was transformed from hunter-gatherers wearing animal skins and living in cow doo-doo huts, to farmers, traders, craftsmen and scholars constructing dolmens, churches and other mass infrastructure projects. We've seen the development of a unique language, culture, religion and a thriving international economy. Ireland transitioned from pagan to Christian and evolved from barbarians to scholars recognised across Europe. Ireland may have escaped the Roman conquests and the Dark Ages that followed, but shared Europe's impact during the Age of Vikings battling to protect life and land. Ireland's fragmented structure of governance was perhaps its greatest weapon against outright invasion and conquer, but it's also proving to be its biggest weakness. For the internal strife between the kingdoms of Ireland would prove its downfall and ultimately lead to a profound transformation, the likes of which have not been seen since the arrival of the first humans millennia previous. The arrival of the Normans set in motion a new age for the next eight centuries. The foundations of which are still the root cause of many struggles plaguing the island today. In an ironic twist, the arrival of the Normans was probably self-inflicted. You see, Ireland, as we discovered last week, was comprised of hundreds of kingdoms, all of whom paid homage to the High King of Ireland. And this ceremonial throne, so to speak, was dominated by the Ulneils, of the North for generations until Brian Baru overthrew and forced into submission virtually every kingdom of Ireland, in some ways crowning himself the de facto king of Ireland. And in many ways Ireland became a little bit more unified while he was king, but after his death in the Battle of Clontarf, Ireland became quite ununified once again and the internal battles and strife between the kingdoms continued Kings were ousted from their thrones and kingdoms were lost and recovered over and over in a perpetual squabble against each other in a real world game of thrones. In the 12th century, one random kingdom and its king, Dermot McMurrah, would take these battles to the next level. Upon the unexpected death of his brother, Dermot became king of Leinster. His crowning was met with opposition by the then High King of Ireland, who was also the King of Connacht. And he feared that Dermot posed a significant threat. And it wasn't long before an enterprise was established to oust Dermot from his inheritance. The High King enlisted the aid of his ally, the King of Breffney. Breffney was a small kingdom comprised primarily of what is now Leitrim and Cavan. The King of Breffney engaged in a cruel attack on the Kingdom of Leinster's livestock, attacking their food supply and starving the kingdom into instability. This plan worked and Dermot was ousted, but only temporarily as he soon regained his throne thanks to the many clans of Leinster coming to his aid. He remained in power for the following two decades, and he even went as far as developing an official alliance, shall we say, with the High Kingship, going into battle and raiding the lands of Tiernan O'Rourke. Dermot apparently abducted Uruk's wife, Dervalog, who we now pronounce today as Dervala. Now history is divided as to how reluctant Dervala was at being taken away from her husband. She remained in Dermot's protection for many years. 1166, the High King, an official ally of Dermot, broke a peace oath with a neighbouring kingdom. This breach led to the majority of his allies quickly distancing themselves which ultimately left the High King alone and vulnerable for attack. And of course that's exactly what happened. And it was this sudden power shift that gave Tiernan O'Rourke perfect opportunity to seek revenge on Dermot, invading Leinster. Dermot was deposed by the new High King of Ireland and exiled forcefully across the Irish Sea to Bristol in England. This is the ultimate pivotal point in Irish history for Dermot's next action would radically alter the destiny of the island for the next 800 years and counting. When you think about our love-hate relationship with our closest neighbour and trading partner, 
the issues of Northern Ireland and why the island is divided in the first place. And why Brexit is stalled on issues over a border, either on land or in the sea. It was this action of Germany over 800 years ago that put Ireland on the path we walk today. Germany sought permission from King Henry II to gather troops to invade Ireland and take back his kingdom. Now let's backtrack two decades earlier. Across the Irish Channel to Clearvox Abbey in the Kingdom of Burgundy was now a region of France. The Archbishop of Armagh, who history would remember as Saint Malachy, had died while en route to Rome. His friend and biographer, Bernard of Clairvaux, best known as Saint Bernard and the founder of Clairvaux Abbey, spoke of Malachy as a reforming bishop and painted Ireland as a barbaric country with a shameless disregard for morals. Moving forward a few years, and the Royal Council of England are squabbling together over plans to invade Ireland. Theobald of Beck, who was Archbishop of Canterbury, had a claim over Ireland. But as part of reforms for the Irish Church in the Sun of Kells of 1152, the Archbishop of Armagh was appointed Primate of Ireland. This was a kind of ceremonial authority, and this was sure to disgruntle Theobald. But plans were halted to invade Ireland because England was in the midst of his own problems. 21-year-old Henry Fitz Empress had just been crowned king of an empire torn apart by domestic disputes, discord among its French territories, all while England was recovering from a 20-year civil war. So there was little hunger for an enterprise across the Irish Sea. Around the same time, Nicholas Breakspeare, an English clergyman, becomes the first and only Englishman elected Pope. He would be known as Pope Adrian IV. In 1155, Port Adrian IV issued the Bull of Lord Abeliter to Henry II. This was a decree granting Henry the right to invade and govern Ireland. It also included the enforcement of Georgian reforms in the Church. This was perhaps the primary motive of the decree, because it's no secret the Church were disgruntled by the mismanagement and lack of reforms being implemented by the Irish Catholic Church. Now we already know Henry wasn't in favour of military operations towards Ireland and followed the advice of his mother, Empress Matilda. So when German McMurrah arrived before the King of England in 1166, this must have been music to the ears of the Royal Council. German received permission from Henry II to solicit the service of Norman mercenaries including Morris and Robert Fitzgerald and Robert de Clare, who history would remember as Strongbow. Early May 1169, and a large fleet of Normans landed on the shores of Banau Bay, County Wexford, and lay siege on Wexford Town. With his well-trained Norman mercenaries from abroad, and the aid of his remaining allies in Ireland, Germa took back his kingdom. But it came with a significant price tag. You see, Henry II didn't grant German permission out of the goodness of his heart. Henry II would be granted lands. So too would Morris and Robert Fitzgerald and Strongbow would be given the biggest prize of all, marriage to German's daughter and become German's successor. German didn't live long after recapturing his throne. He died in early 1171 and Strongbow succeeded him. With reluctance from the indigenous clans, but Strongbow came out on top in the end. And this made Henry II very uncomfortable. In fact, he was becoming increasingly concerned about the power of the Norman masonries in Ireland. And to put down his authority, the same year of German's death, he accompanied a second wave of Norman invasions to Waterford. Many of the kingdoms submitted to Henry. The church must have been beside themselves, with Adrian IV's successor, Pope Alexander III, congratulating Henry on muzzling the barbaric nation, succeeding in their goal of pushing the reforms on the Catholic Church of Ireland. And of course the nice taxes that would start flowing towards Rome now. And Henry awarded lands to his youngest son, John, with the title of Dominus Hiberniae, Lord of Ireland. And when John became King of England, these lands came under English Crown territory. When you look back at Germans, he was very naive in thinking he could utilise a foreign army to his own advantage. 
Perhaps he was blinded by revenge and pure ambition for the High Kingship of Ireland. Either way, he was seen as a traitor, aiding the invasion of Ireland by the English. His obituary in the Gaelic Annals reads, Dermot MacMurrah, King of Leinster, after having brought over the Saxons, after having done extensive injury to the Irish, after plundering and burning many churches, died before the end of the year of an insufferable unknown disease. He died at Ferns without making a will, without penance, without the body of Christ, without unction, as his evil deeds deserved. The consequences of Norman presence transformed the island over the next 200 years. Dominating castles and churches popped up across the colonised island. Feudalism was introduced and lands were divided with hedges and county borders started to take shape. It was this period that the English language started to spread, while Brennan Law's, the Gaelic system of governance, was slowly replaced by common law. The Parliament of Ireland was established in 1297 and the Lordship of Ireland claimed lordship over the entire island, despite large parts of the island still remaining under Gaelic control by Gaelic kingdoms. And the regions of Gaelic and Normans fluctuated over the centuries, while many Normans integrated with the Gaelic kingdoms. Over time, there wasn't a clean-cut divide between Northern and Gaelic Ireland. The Catholic Church was just as complicit in the invasion of Ireland as the English Crown was. And I guess back in those days, they were much the same. The Church held strong influence across European kingdoms, and Rome now enjoyed the flow of taxes from Ireland after the first papal taxation register compiled between 1302 and 1307. This was the first census of Ireland, which included a list of properties. By now we have entered the 14th century, a period of unrest and disruption across Europe to which Ireland was not immune from. With a devastating global pandemic, the Black Death was one of the many factors that saw Norman hold over Ireland decline and paved the way for a Gaelic resurgence. And it is here I will leave you for this week. The Shaping Ireland series is going to take a little break for a while. Now the college has started back, I don't have the same time as I did over the summer to put into producing these podcasts. So until we return in 2021, bye for now.